Hello there. Welcome once again to Stuff and Things, where I like to talk about stuff and occasionally even things. I'm your good friend Bradley, and I just packed a bowl of Ashton's Artisan Blend on this pleasant Sunday smoke. I thought I'd try out a little bit of this. I've had this before, but I've had this tin for a long time and hadn't cracked it open. Meant to do a review on it, and I will be doing a review. Not this week, though. I need to smoke more of it down. I haven't had it in a while, so I have to sort of refresh my memory. But this is a blend that has some Syrian Latakia in here. So it's one of those kind of diamonds in the rough, one of those diamonds in the rough. Not a lot of Syrian Latakia left. Anything that is left is from decades ago, basically stores that people have kept for a very long time. So this uh, Ashton's Artisan blend, things like the McBaron Vintage Syrian, there's some McCle McClellan blends that have Syrian Latakia in them. I always recommend get them while you can because you don't know how long it's gonna be around. But this is a, it's a very interesting blend, pretty strong for a, well, not strong for an English blend, but I'd say it almost ranks up there around nightcap um, in terms of strength, full flavored quality to it, to it. Can't speak. We're inside today on the Sunday smoke because it's actually raining here in the Pacific Northwest, which I'm quite pleased about actually. Um, I know that maybe a lot of people won't, don't consider overcast rainy weather to be a good thing, but we need it. It's been way too long since it's rained here. And, uh, ugh, I was getting kind of sick of the sun for, I don't know, how long has it been? Three months in a row, hardly any rain. So we had one of those nice, just kind of overcast, kind of windy, drizzly days. I know that doesn't sound nice, but I was quite enjoying it, but it's not conducive to being out sitting on a rock by the seaside. And my Peterson. Normally lights every time. Not sure what the deal is right now. Maybe my flint's about to go out. Mm. I'm enjoying a special treat right now. You've seen me many, many times in the past drinking Dr. Pepper, my favorite soda. Well, today we have, oh, the bottled, glass bottled Dr. Pepper made with real sugar cane. Delightful. There are some hooligans shrieking in the background. They're playing cornhole down on the street. I'm not sure if people internationally are aware of cornhole. Sounds like something dirty, but it's a weird game where people cut out a hole in a piece of plywood and they throw bean bags at the hole. It's become popular in recent years for some reason. So you'll have to excuse if you hear some high pitched shrieking in the background every once in a while. Now, as I said, I'm not gonna be reviewing Artisan Blend this week. This will be coming up eventually, but what I did review, just finished recording my review of this. It is the Lamy Studio fountain pen. This was my very first kind of over $30 fountain pen. I think this cost, I don't know, 60 some dollars when I bought it. You can get it for around 70 or so, anywhere from like 60 to $80. But it was my first kind of decent fountain pen, but it still has, you know, a steel nib and still uses a cartridge converter filling system. So it's not an internal filling mechanism or anything. So it's similar to some of the lower end Lamy pens, but just a kind of a nicer finish pen. It has more heft, more weight to it, kind of classier. So I did a review of this. This will be out mm, probably Wednesday of this week. So you can look forward to that, you fountain pen people. Other than that, just been keeping busy with work, social obliga obligations, things like that. I wrote some things down to talk about and let me peruse this really quick. Oh yeah, 
Something came to mind the other day. I was out in front of my favorite bagel place, having a bagel, having some coffee, and a friend of mine walked up and he was with a stranger, someone I had never seen before. And my friend approached me with this stranger and he came up, hey, how's it going? What's going on? I'm like, hey, how you doing? Looked expectantly at his friend. I'm like, okay, you're gonna introduce us here. And the guy said, oh, hey, how you doing? And he shook my hand. And I think I asked his name, he told me his name. And I said, oh, what part of Canada are you from? Are you from Vancouver, somewhere in BC? Because I could tell by the way he smoke, smoked, spoke that he was Canadian. He took issue with this. He was actually offended by me saying this. And he said, how do you know I'm Canadian? And I was like, well, uh, I could just tell by your accent. I could tell you're Canadian. And he said, accent? What accent? I don't have an accent. <laughs> Canadians and Americans sound exactly alike. And I've heard this argument from Canadians so many times. And I always find it funny because within three words of him speaking to me, I knew he was Canadian. So how would I know that if there was no Canadian accent? And I've had, I don't know if I've ever had a Canadian admit to me that they sound different than the average American. The average Canadian sounds different than the average American. And obviously there are all sorts of regional variations. You know, you go to the East Coast of the US, East Coast of Canada, Newfoundland. There's all sorts of interesting, strange accents, but kind of the standard American and the standard Canadian there is a difference. And I'm not saying like the stereotypical, like, hey, what's going on, hey, what are you talking about? I'm not talking about that. But there is definitely this sort of Canadian lilt to the way people speak, even if it's very minor, and I can tell. And it's not a bad thing or anything, it's just, it's a difference. There is an accent. But for some reason, Canadians seem very resistant to that. And every Canadian I've ever met, and this is mostly people from BC, um, they always say that they that we sound exactly as they do, but it's not true. And I just find that interesting to think of like, is this just willfully ignoring the fact and I don't even know why they would, or is it the kind of thing where their ear just can't hear it? And it started me thinking about just accents in general. I'm always really interested in that. I'm, I'm really interested in linguistics. I'm interested in, the history of the English language, because I speak the English, English language, if I, could, if I can speak the English language. Um, so obviously that interests me. And I'm not gonna go into the whole history of the English language, how, you know, from Proto-Indo-European to Old Germanic to, you know, I'm not gonna go into all that to getting English to where it is now, but, Regional accents, regional dialects, I find that really, really interesting. And in America, obviously, we don't have quite the variation that you get in the UK. I mean, there's every little town and city in the UK seems to have their own regional dialect. But then they also have sort of the received pronunciation, the kind of BBC, British accent, English accent, which I guess is kind of dying out a little bit now um, because they're more open to just people having their own regional accents and things like that. But there is kind of a general, general middle-class English accent and then sort of the general American accent, which kind of developed from a Midwestern accent, which sort of became the broadcast accent and then sort of the California thing. But it's interesting because I've read up a lot about this kind of thing and I don't know if this is gonna bore you or not, but where I live, the Pacific Northwest, the accent here is, I would say, almost indistinguishable from just general American, especially to someone who doesn't speak English as their native language or someone who isn't American, maybe, and even a lot of Americans, I would say. But supposedly the Pacific Northwest accent, according to linguists, is the least inflected native English spoken in the world. And that doesn't mean there's no accent. It just means it has the least inflection. So we're not going up and down. There's not a lot of tonal shift in the English at all. There's almost none. It is just very straight line, kind of flat line, no lilt to the language at all. And if you hear me speaking, I mean, I guess that's probably the case. I, it's hard for me to kind of step outside myself. Um, and there's a lot of 
we could get into all the sort of vowel sound shifts that have happened within the American accent. And it's really fascinating because, you know, a lot of the East Coast accents in the U.S., there's a, a lot of variation. There's the Boston accent, the New York accent, the sort of Long Island accent, New Jersey, and there's more, they're actually a much closer to kind of the UK accents that exist now. Um, one thing that's very interesting to me, I don't know if it's interesting to any of you, but general American, we still pronounce our R's. It's a very rhotic language, R-H-O-T-I-C. So when I say the word car, there's a very obvious car, like there's almost a growly kind of R sound in there. And in the UK, for the most part, people do not pronounce their R's at the end of words. So it would be ka or do. There's not ka, ka, ka. It's, it's, they don't pronounce that rhotic sound very often. Just as on the East Coast of the US, often those dialects, they do not pronounce those rhotic ending R sounds. And there's a theory that says that the English spoken in the time of Shakespeare was erotic language in the UK, and they did pronounce their R's. And as people settled in the Americas, the people who went into the middle of the country um, and weren't on the Eastern seaboard kept that quality. They kept that erotic R sound. And the people who were on the Eastern seaboard who still had a lot of um, interaction with the English, a lot of trade, a lot of cultural exchange, the English accent on mainland in the UK changed drastically from the 1600s till the late 1800s. And the American English spoken on the Eastern seaboard sort of changed with it. There was a lot of sharing of dialect back and forth. And so that's why the Boston accent, the New York accent is closer to modern British English or UK English. And then the Midwestern accent, the people who in the US who didn't have a lot of contact with the British and the people on the Eastern Seaboard kept this more rhotic form of English. And so people surmise that perhaps the general American accent is actually closer in many ways to the original, well, not the original, but the UK English, and it wasn't the UK at the time, the English English spoken on the British Isles or in England around the time of Shakespeare. Interesting. They actually do performances at the Globe Theatre, <clears throat> the Globe Theatre in London, and occasionally they'll do a an original pronunciation version of Shakespeare. So not of the like oh, Titus sort of modern Shakespeare that they do now, like oh Romeo, Romeo. They do the what they think from what best they can figure out was the original pronunciation. So it's more of this kind of growly, and there's it's a very erotic. They pronounce their R's. And a lot of the, the rhymes and puns and things that don't necessarily make sense to us now because of the way we pronounce words actually do make sense if you pronounce them in the way that supposedly they were originally pronounced. And of course, I have no examples for you right now, but look up uh, on YouTube, just look up Shakespeare original pronunciation. You'll find some interesting videos. Is this interesting to you at all? I find this kind of thing fascinating. And just going through all this, I had a, thinking about the way your own accent is perceived by someone who is not a native speaker or not from your area is very fascinating to me. There was this English guy I met the other week who was from Bristol and he was talking about how for one thing, he could not differentiate very well between the different American accents. So he was talking about how he couldn't really tell if someone was from Boston or from New York or whatever. And then when he was talking, I mean, I've watched enough British television to know kind of the difference between a Northerner's accent and a Southern accent or a West Country accent. But he was talking about how he gets made fun of for his Bristol accent sometimes. And to me, I can kind of tell he's from Bristol maybe, but there's no sort of cultural baggage attached to that. To me, it's just another English accent. But I guess in England, it's sort of, I'm not sure exactly, maybe it has kind of a hick or redneck sort of connotation to it or something. Anyway, he said he was made fun of for it. And it's funny because when I think about that, you know, no offense, 
to anyone from the South, but it's kind of the way a Southern accent might be perceived in the US where, I don't know, I was watching some video on, I, I like gun videos sometimes on YouTube. I like guns, I'm American. And uh, occasionally or often, a lot of the people who make videos about guns in the US are from the South because they just happen to have more guns down there. And I came upon one with this guy who was just, hey, this is my Glock 19, it's my favorite pistol. It's really accurate. And he just, he talked like that. And now he could be a very intelligent person, but for some reason that just amuses me. And there's that kind of cultural connotation between that accent and a certain kind of person. In fact, I had a friend who, who was Austrian, this girl who came to stay with me from Austria. She was coming here to go to school. And I'm just fascinated to be able to talk to someone who speaks English as a second language because their perception of English causes me to question things that I never would have questioned about my own native language. So she'll ask questions that make me make me wonder like, oh yeah, why do we say that? Why is that spelled that way? And then it leads me to kind of investigate. But she had shown me this YouTube video. She's like, oh, you have to watch this. It's so funny. She gets on YouTube and she shows me this Austrian guy who's sitting on a tractor and he starts speaking and he's speaking in German, but it's, you know, an Austrian dialect of German. Now I can, I can recognize German being spoken. I do not have anywhere near the ear to be able to tell if someone is from Bavaria or from Berlin or from Austria, Austria when they're speaking German. It just sounds like German to me. And this guy on the tractor starts speaking in German and she just starts laughing hysterically. It's the funniest thing she's ever heard in her entire life. And I'm wondering, okay, is he just telling these jokes? Is he hilarious? But no, it's because of his accent, apparently. She's like, listen, listen to how he talks. It's so funny. And I'm like, I'm just hearing a guy speak in German. There's nothing funny about this to me at all. It's just, does this make any sense to you? Is this interesting at all? I just find that fascinating. Like, I can't tell that he talks funny. And she couldn't tell, probably if there was someone from the South, like, hey, how you doing? She wouldn't necessarily think that there was anything amusing about that. And I guess there shouldn't be. I'm not trying to be mean to people from the South. It was funny because we had never met before when she came to stay with me. It was through couchsurfing.com. Um, and she had never been to America, but she had learned most of her English, you know, obviously in school, but then her conversational skills were basically all through American television and American movies. And I was the very first person she met in the US when I picked her up at the bus station. And she was so thrilled just by speaking to me. She's like, you sound like the movies. And it's kind of funny to think about that. Within a couple weeks we were dating, or actually within a couple days we were dating. I'm assuming that's just because I was basically the only person she knew, but I get along really well with people from foreign lands because I'm just fascinated. Don't get me wrong, I love Americans. I think they're, by and large, very nice, generous people, but I'm surrounded by them. I'm one of them. I'm always interested to meet and speak to people who are from other places, who might have a different perspective on things. This has been a weird Sunday smoke. Probably really un uninteresting to a lot of you. These are just these things that I can kind of, my mind can sort of spin out on every once in a while where I just start thinking and thinking and thinking about perception and how people view the world and how, I don't know, it's, I find it fascinating. I'm sorry if you didn't, maybe next week I'll try to have more of a normal Sunday smoke. Hopefully I'll be able to get out and show you some more interesting scenery. I think it's supposed to be nicer next week, sunny. Um, so yeah, I think I'll just cut it short right now. I'm enjoying this Ashton Artisans blend. I won't have a review, as I said, up this week, but maybe next week I'll have one. We'll see. I need to smoke enough to get a really nice, fresh idea of it in my head. But the review of the Lamy Studio will be forthcoming this week. But for right now, I'm going to let you go. I would like to thank you once again for watching the Stuff and Things channel, for subscribing to the channel, for liking the videos. I really appreciate it. But until next time, until we meet again, I've been your good friend Bradley. You have been the audience. This has been Stuff and Things on a really weird and rambling Sunday smoke. Good day.